Down the Dark Lane, Three Thrillers from the Motel, by Ned DeHaan. The audiobook, made available on Black Box Online Radio. Please consider supporting this channel at buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxned88 to make a donation or contribution to help the show. Author's Note Thank you for choosing to read these three stories. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am the author of the novel Killer on a White Horse, A Story of the Evening Watchman. This book contains a sequel story at the end, which was released in 2022. And now I would like to begin with the first story, The Open Road Shall Decide. There were three drops of blood resting on the white fabric. Mandy loved her white bandana. She didn't wear it in school because she wasn't allowed, but any time she went outside of the building or away from the schoolyard, she adorned the white bandana with the most basic black design. Many people even called her Mandy in the White Bandana. She was now seventeen years old, maybe five foot three or five foot four. She had a scar on her chest that was hidden under whatever t shirt she wore. Mandy almost always wore a white t shirt and jeans or khakis, but she had always admired the silk fabrics that she had seen in her mother's catalogues while growing up. Of course, she had never worn real silk. She was holding her beloved white bandana with the three drops of blood. Mandy had killed her best friend, stabbed her, watched her die. How did life come to this? She had known her best friend Violet for almost eleven years. Then one day, Violet was no more. As a native of Reno, Nevada, it wasn't too hard to get to a place where no one could find you. The mountains were covered with short pine trees, and sometimes, if you looked out far enough, you could see snow caps on the mountains, even in the summertime. Mandy had walked out into the middle of nowhere. Not a single soul was around to join her. She filled a plastic water bottle with gasoline from her father's red gas can that he kept in the backyard shed. Mandy lived in one of the few houses on the street that didn't have a grass lawn. Instead, the yard was lined with sand and light gravel, which was normal for many of the houses in Reno, just not on Mandy Street. She filled the bottle and returned to the middle of nowhere. Mandy soaked her beloved white bandana in the fuel, and she struck a single match, the hardwood kind, not like those flimsy matches they sell at the supermarkets. The flames took the white fabric with speed and opportunity. Then Mandy walked away. Her favorite white bandana was gone, but her former best friend, Violet, was not, for the image of Violet's eyes had been ingrained in her memory. A tear almost came to Mandy's eye, but she did not cry. She wanted to be back in Violet's house before the evil had started, sitting on the red carpet in Violet's living room, looking at the catalogs of dresses, designing Halloween costumes, talking about going to college, and everything else that normal people did, that best friends did, before the evil took them all away. Mandy began to walk, and she didn't know where she was going. She couldn't go back home. All she could do was imagine... Chapter 1. One week later. The stretches of highway in northern Nevada were dotted with evergreens, smooth mountain peaks, and a whole lot of dust. However, in southern Nevada, where Mandy was now, the hills were rough and the rocks were jagged. The landscape always had a reddish-brown color to it, no matter where you went. Mandy was walking in the desert now. After she had left Reno, a woman driving a black Mitsubishi coupe had seen her and on the side of the road. She offered to take her as far as Tonopah, Nevada. From there, an elderly woman had offered her a ride down to the edge of Death Valley, but still on the Nevada side. The sight of donkeys running up and down the highway was perhaps the only thing that broke the tension. Mandy was on the run. She had no idea if she was listed as a missing person or not. She was the only child to two parents. Her father was somewhat of an alcoholic, and her mother turned a blind eye to everyone but herself. Mandy thought about them a little, very little, in fact. Sometimes she thought about Violet and her light blonde hair and powerful brown eyes. Violet was a knockout anywhere she went. If they ever walked down the street together, Mandy could see all the guys gazing upon Violet first, and almost no one looked at her. Mandy had parted ways with the elderly woman in Beatty, Nevada and caught a spare seat on the bus heading to a town called Parump. Someone had told her that she could pay cash if she called the number that was written on the flyer in the woman's restroom. 
It was one of those glossy printings, which looked like it had been made in a design shop, but Mandy was pretty sure they also had them at Office Max, Office Depot, and Staples. When the bus arrived, it turned out that it wasn't a bus at all, but a rather large black van that had the word Express written on the side. As she rode in the black van, the sun began to set. The running donkeys in the desert were still a great distraction, even on this stretch of road. But the setting sun in the desert trumped it all. For a brief second, Mandy forgot about everything. But the second went by, and the night had fallen on the Nevada desert. The bus stop in Pahrump was at a place called the Nugget Hotel. The black taxi-style van had pulled right up to the curb. Then she gazed upon the open spaces before her. Pahrump felt like a town with two, maybe three roads, residential and not super welcoming. From there, Mandy just began walking, walking once again, looking for her next ride. It had been like this for four days. She even slept on the cold desert sand. Part of her was afraid of scorpions and snakes, and the other, more power-centered part of her didn't care at all. She was experiencing life on the run. Mandy had done something horrible, but no one would have understood the evil. She couldn't tell anyone what had happened to Violet, because they wouldn't believe her. They wouldn't comprehend it. Now Mandy was walking out of town. She had expected that the town would have been bigger. Maybe she was heading toward Las Vegas. She had never been to Pahrump before, but she knew it was in southern Nevada, in the direction of Vegas. People up north were always talking about it. It was normal to hear someone who went to high school in Pahrump, or that they knew the new college that had just been built. And even one chatterbox lady she had met at the CVS said she worked at a hospital there. However, it was getting dark now, and Mandy smirked to herself for a second, thinking that all parts of the desert looked the same at night. As she began to walk down the lonely stretch of highway, the darkness of a summer night was finally taking over, and the stars began to populate the sky. Another night on the sand, Mandy said aloud. Mandy wasn't broke. She had $139 left in her pocket. No purse, no wallet, just cash tightly pressed in the pocket of her light-colored blue jeans. Now she was wearing a dark-colored t-shirt instead of her usual white one, and the dark t-shirt did rather well at hiding the sweat and some of the dirt, but she missed the white bandana. It would have kept the sand out of her hair. In her navy blue and black backpack, Mandy had some soap, and she even had bathed three times using a 16-ounce plastic bottle and refilling it. She couldn't live like this forever, but she had made a choice, and she couldn't bring herself back to civilization. Mandy was doomed to wander the desert until something else came along. As she walked down the highway, a red pickup truck slowed and then stopped. Mandy wasn't paying close attention, but she thought it could have been a Ford Ranger, or maybe of one of those Chevy S10s. Her father was a car dealer, so she knew some of them, but in all honesty, she wasn't interested whenever he talked about anything from the auto industry. The window of the red pickup slid down. A man with a light beard, maybe red or brown, was sitting in the driver's seat. He was wearing a light-colored t-shirt. It could have been white, but Mandy couldn't see too well, for it almost looked like a light blue. After the sun had decided to rest behind the mountains, the only light on the landscape that had come was the glow of the moon, and some other lights glowed from the truck. She also had no intention of getting into a car or truck with any man. Hey, do you need a ride or something? he asked her. Mandy shook her head, indicating no without any words. She didn't even look at him when he asked the question. Hey, just so you know... "'There's nothing for miles,' he called to her again. "'Look, where are you headed?' "'Vegas,' Mandy muttered in a barely audible voice. "'Well, you're walking in the wrong direction,' he revealed. Mandy stopped moving. "'Shit!' she murmured. The man seemed non-threatening. "'Why didn't she just get in?' "'No, she couldn't. "'This is how women became victims of serial killers.' Mandy knew this was a bad idea, but she grabbed the handle on the pickup door, and she opened it. Then she gently closed it and dropped her eyes to the floor. The low-riding pickup was filled with empty bottles of various types and food wrappers. Next, she looked up at the man. His eyes were still non-threatening. He was much older than her. Well, not much older, but maybe he was just shy of thirty. "'Hey, I'm heading to Vegas myself,' he said. 
I mean, I'm like you, on the road, I was working a job out in the desert, well, forget about that, I meant to say, I was using this website, hotwire.com, and I found a motel for the night that's in between Vegas and Pahrump, I can take you as far as there, but, well, I can take you as far as there, I guess, um, you'll be on your own after that, but, I, I use GPS, I won't get lost, uh, what's your name, by the way, I'm Darrow, Amanda, she answered. Amanda, her legal name, what a wonderful way to go. Mandy had always wondered about criminals on the run, like why they use their real names. She had seen that on the TV as a kid, and wanted posters at the post office. She always wondered why someone named John Smith would start using an alias like John Jones. Yet, there she was. She had just answered with her real name out of habit. So, what on earth are you doing out in the desert at this hour? Daryl asked her. Walking, Mandy answered. To Las Vegas, right? He pressed. I was trying to, she replied with an ounce of embarrassment. Mandy truly felt the cold air from Daryl's air conditioner, and it brought a sign of comfort. The heat in Nevada was almost always dry, but even sitting in the vehicle made her realize just how rough life on the run was. In all seriousness, Mandy was dreading the idea of using the desert sand as a pillow for another night. So... What work do you do out in the desert? Mandy asked Darrell. I'm a diesel mechanic, he answered. But you don't drive a diesel pickup truck, Mandy said in a light-hearted way. <laughs> diesel pickup truck, huh? All right, all right, Amanda with the observations, Darrell went on. I'm gonna watch what I say around you, but this is not a work vehicle, and I don't do operations on pickup trucks. I work on industrial equipment. I don't meet too many girls. I mean, w women <laughs> like you. I mean, I don't meet too many w women who talk about trucks and diesel and equipment. My father was a car salesman, she returned. Mandy was feeling nervous. The nervousness was approaching the maximum level. She knew better. Why was she telling him these things that were true? Sure, this Daryl, if that was his real name, seemed harmless, but most of the people who survive terrible crimes on the television often describe the person that attacked them as being the nicest guy in the world. Moreover, why did she say that her father was a car salesman? Not was, he was still alive. It was Violet who was gone. How old are you? Mandy asked Daryl. Twenty-four, Daryl answered. What about you? What? Mandy jumped back a little. You look a lot older. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But you shouldn't guess people's ages when they're in the dark. How about you? How old are you, Amanda? Seventeen, she told the truth again. Daryl was driving the pickup so his eyes were on the road, but he slowed down a little. Oh, he said in a flat way. Mandy ignored it. Anyway, Amanda, Daryl started. Where are you coming from? Tonapa, she answered. It was halfway true. Ah, uh, you must have seen that clown motel on your way down. Daryl tried to keep the atmosphere light. You mean the motel in the middle of the desert with all the clown artwork? Mandy grumbled. Yeah, I saw that. I hate clowns. Everyone does, Daryl went on. I mean, anyone with a brain and common sense and judgment does. So, like I said, I was using this website, hotwire.com, and normally they put you in a place like the Comfort Inn or a Comfort Suites or something like that. But they said that tonight I'm going to stay in a place called the Miner's Edge Motel. I don't, I didn't know how, how this thing operated, and I didn't know they worked with places like, you know, the mom and pop kind and such. Well, I don't know why, but for some reason, that sounded incredibly creepy to me. The Miner's Edge Motel. It's not a chain, is it? I don't know, Mandy whispered. Ah, I see, Daryl went on. Look at me, I'm rambling too much. I often get like that. You see, when you're working out in the desert, you get used to spending time alone. Sometimes I end up talking to myself when there's no one around, and some people think that isn't good for you, but you just get used to it. I know the feeling, Mandy concurred. Well, I doubt you want to hear anything about a diesel mechanic working out in the middle of nowhere, so the GPS says we have ten minutes until the destination. Amanda, I will let you choose the topic of conversation. You said your name is Daryl, right? Mandy tried to confirm. Yes, Daryl, with two R's in the middle, he informed her. Daryl, do you believe in evil? Mandy asked. Chapter 2 The small pickup truck 
pulled into the dimly lit parking lot of the Miner's Edge Motel. The outside of the building was light-colored, but it was hard to tell in the dark. Mandy guessed that it was maybe white, but it could have been beige or eggshell or something else. The roof was dark, and she could see the shingles clearly under the night sky. The Miner's Edge Motel was one of those establishments that was mostly one story, but near the motel office there was a second level, which maybe had five or six rooms. Mandy always loved that when she was a kid. The few times they had gone on a family vacation, she had always wanted a motel room that was on the second floor. If it had a balcony, that would have been ideal. But she just didn't like the idea of looking out the window at the ground level. It seemed boring. Mandy released a faint sigh as she began to wonder how and why memories like that seemed important at the time. Now she was either a missing person, a fugitive, or both. As Daryl's truck pulled into the parking lot, she made a quick gaze at the neon lights of the motel sign. Miner's Edge was so dim, you could barely make out the words from a distance. However, there was a much brighter sign below it that said vacancy. The light for the motel office was also bright, in that red-orange neon coloring. Mandy grabbed the handle of Daryl's truck, but she paused. "'What's wrong?' Daryl asked. "'What do I do now?' she asked. I don't know, Darrell returned. I'm going to check in and get a key. I'm going to wait here, Mandy replied. That's for the best, Darrell responded. Look, Amanda, I wasn't expecting to meet you tonight. I only prepaid for a single room. Some places are, um, difficult about those things. They try to charge you more money. Some places don't care, but it's really hard to know. What should I do? She pondered out loud. You just, uh, sit here and wait, he reminded her. I meant, after you go inside, she answered. Do you mind if I sleep in your truck tonight? I have nowhere else to go. You can't sleep in the passenger seat of a pickup, Amanda, he answered. If you want to come in, you can. Just let me get the key. I, I don't, is there only one bed? I, I don't, she began to mutter. I have no idea, he admitted. Just wait, please. Daryl decided not to take the conversation any further. He had also shrugged off the question from earlier about believing in evil. He exited the cab and walked into the motel office. About five minutes later, he returned carrying a key card and a small white envelope. He got back in the cab of the pickup and started the engine. The manager said it is um, in un the unit down at the end. It's um over there. I'm just going to drive over. It's room 900. Not on the second floor? Amanda almost whimpered. A second ago, you wanted to sleep in the cab of the truck, Daryl huffed. Oh, oh yeah, I, I still can, Mandy pointed out. You don't have to, I'm sure there'll be room, he offered. Once the truck was parked, Daryl hopped out, and he opened the motel door. A second later, Mandy followed. She was making quick glances at back at the motel office to see if anyone was looking at them through the windows. Mandy almost scurried into room 900. Normally, she would have thought twice about entering someone's motel room like this, but she was on the run now. Fear of all things except capture was subsiding. Daryl placed the plastic key card into the light-colored holder on the wall and flicked a light switch. There was only one motel bed, rather large, maybe even a king-size bed, but there was only one. The motel had a TV that looked like it had been made in the 1970s, but Mandy knew that it couldn't possibly be that old. In the spaces between the bed and the walls, there were two miniature nightstands, which looked firmly packed into place. The motel had two windows that were covered in light blue opaque curtains with small streaks of green and pink woven into them. They almost matched the bedspreads, but not quite. I can sleep on the floor, Mandy insisted. Now, you are my guest, Daryl challenged her. I can sleep on the floor. You seem to have had a longer day than I have. What makes you say that? she retorted hastily. Walking in the desert all afternoon and evening and night, Daryl stated the obvious. For your information, I spent part of it in a taxi van, Mandy thought silently. You can have the bed, Mandy shot at Daryl. Now that he was standing under the overhead light, Mandy could see that she had misjudged Daryl's appearance. His hair was dirty blonde, his arms were small and lanky, but his chest stood out more than she had expected. Daryl grinned for a second, and he took a pillow and pulled it off from the bed, and he put it under the light, and then took off the bedspread onto the floor. I'll take the floor, he decided. 
Mandy walked around and took the other pillow. I'll take the floor, too, she challenged back. Daryl emitted a strange laugh. A feeling came over Mandy. For the first time since Violet had died, Mandy felt a feeling of warmth. It was almost as if she was having fun. The feeling faded fast when she realized that Violet was no longer alive. She was dead, and she had died at Mandy's own hand. A painful memory came back, but Mandy didn't want to say what it was. Hey, uh, are you okay? Daryl asked. Yeah, Mandy muttered. She tried to forget the memory for just a second. Look, Amanda, Daryl began, I don't have any food. I mean, I already ate dinner, and I don't have any water because we drank it all in the truck. Look, it looks like they have a coffee pot. I mean, I can make some hot water or some, like, um, decaf coffee. They have, like, two free pouches or packets. I don't know what they're called. Yeah, coffee, decaf, she agreed. After all that time in the desert, Mandy wanted something with flavor. After fixing the coffee and listening to the sound of percolating drops, Mandy and Darrow were both seated on the floor of the Miner's Edge Motel, with their backs to the wall. The room had a short hallway down to the bathroom. There was just enough space for them to sit down. Amanda? Darrow began. You can call me Mandy if you want, she interrupted him. Mandy, sure, Darrow went on. Back on the road, why did you ask me about evil? Mandy's lips turned into a flat line. I shouldn't have done that, she apologized. I didn't mean to. Oh, I, I want to. I don't know. It sounds like you know exactly what you want to say, but you're not saying it. Mandy felt the cool, uneven texture of the motel wall. I did something bad, she told him. She wanted to tell him the whole story, but what would he do? For the first time in a long time, she had a place to stay. She wanted to just sit and wait until the morning. Or perhaps, if she made it to Las Vegas, or maybe one day cross the Mexican border, then maybe the evil wouldn't find her. How far would she have to run? We've all done bad things, Mandy, said Darrell. He got up and poured them a cup of decaffeinated coffee in styrofoam motel cups. Then he slowly sat down and handed it to her. Not like me, she responded. Well, I can't leave it at that, Darrell went on. I'm intrigued now. I shouldn't say, Mandy spoke softly. Okay, Daryl conceded. But so you know, uh, much like Planet Fitness, this is a judgment-free zone. I'm not going to get mad at you. Yeah, you will, she challenged him. Try me, Daryl pressed. I asked you before if you believed in evil, she tried to change the subject. I didn't get a straight answer. Daryl's eyes grew wider. I don't believe in evil. He tried his best. So my answer is no. Anything about supernatural things, gods and devils, I don't believe in it. None of it. I don't listen to any of them. Anyone selling a book about religion is not going to get my money. I only believe in people. People do things. They have reasons why they do things. Sometimes other people don't understand it. There is no good and bad. There is only different. Is that the answer that you wanted? What if I killed someone? she inquired. Mandy's whole body felt like fire. Why was she asking the question like this? It made it sound so obvious that she was guilty of something. I don't think you killed anyone. Daryl tried not to laugh. Mandy felt so tense she couldn't hide the truth anymore. I... she wanted to reveal her story. I have a question for you. Daryl cut her off. Why did you get in my truck today? I mean, I was glad to give you a ride. You were in the middle of the desert. I saw you walking, and I wanted to help. You are welcome to stay here, Amanda. Mandy. But why? You seem awfully trusting. You were asking me, what if you killed someone? What makes you think I'm not a serial killer? Mandy bit her lower lip, and she wheezed a little. You are not, she determined. And how do you know that? He questioned her thinking. You wouldn't refer to yourself as a serial killer if you were, she decided. I mean, I don't think I've ever heard of one of those guys like Gacy or Dahmer or Bundy say, what if I'm a serial killer? They didn't say it. They just killed people. How do you know what they said to their victims? <laughs> Daryl snickered. Their victims are dead. I don't know, Mandy dismissed. I'm just guessing. 
Well, that's fine, he concluded. No, it isn't, Mandy wanted to continue. I'm sorry, Daryl seemed genuinely perplexed. You asked, how do I know that you're not a serial killer? She started and then paused. A serial killer wouldn't ask that. I mean, they wouldn't think of themselves as a serial killer. If you mean someone who tries to pass himself off in normal life and society, living among normal people, and like living a serial killer double life, I don't think he would think of himself as a serial killer. He might think everyone else is wrong and he is right. He's not a serial killer in his mind. He is a do-gooder. A do-gooder? <laughs> Daryl laughed. You're laughing, but maybe it's true, Mandy defended. It seems like you've read a little about this. Daryl guessed. I don't read a lot, she confessed. I watch TV, though. I used to, anyway. Well, I like to read about it, Daryl talked in a calmer way. You see, people have bad experiences, particularly in the early years of their life. Someone has abused them, or maybe even neglected them, and they recreate the cycle of destructive behaviors because they want to prove to themselves that what happened to them was normal. Mandy took a deep sigh. She had interacted with several people over the last week, but she never felt the slightest urge to share what had happened with Violet. Now talking to Daryl, she wanted to reveal the secrets. She knew she shouldn't. She would end up in jail. There was absolutely no beneficial outcome that could come from spilling the truth. But she had to say something. Chapter 3 I need to tell you something, Mandy told Daryl. She held the white styrofoam cup in her hand and watched the decaf coffee make small waves as she moved it in a gentle way. I'm all ears, said Daryl. Mandy looked up at him, and they were eye to eye, seated on the floor of the Miner's Edge Motel. I killed someone, she uttered in a strange way. Yeah... Daryl scoffed. His voice almost sounded like a faint laugh as he took a sip from his coffee cup. I mean it, Daryl, she persisted. Yeah, right, he denied her. And I'm a half-Vietnamese kickboxer who was born in Guam and eats salmon salad surprise sandwiches on Thursdays. What are you talking about? Mandy was not impressed with his sarcasm. Okay, she muttered. Then her eyes moved back to the coffee waves. Now you made me rethink everything, Daryl shot back. Like you said, I'm not a serial killer, because I said the term serial killer. I don't think you killed anyone, Amanda, I mean Mandy, but what did you want to say? Forget it, she muttered again. The bond she thought she had with Daryl was breaking, inch by inch. What? Daryl argued. How am I supposed to forget that? You just said it wasn't true a second ago, Mandy almost coughed. Mandy... Daryl tried to soothe. What is going on? I said that because you were talking about killing someone. What was I supposed to say? Someone just blurts it out like that? I still don't know what you're talking about, but I know that there is something that you want to say. She did indeed want to share with him. If I tell you, she began, you have to promise. No, wait, I mean, you don't have to promise anything. If you call the police, I'll just run. I'll disappear into the desert. I've done that once, more than once, really. But I killed my best friend. No way, Daryl rejected her statement. Mandy could tell that Daryl didn't comprehend what she was saying. His demeanor and mannerisms clearly gave the impression that he didn't believe her about what had happened with Violet. Her name was Violet. Violet Nichols, Mandy began. Such an innocent name when I say it like that. For years it had been the two of us. We met on a playground when we were seven years old. Violet was always prettier and better looking. She was smarter, too. She was going to be an Ivy Leaguer. I would have been lucky to get into Great Basin College. Her parents were rich, too. I mean, not like really rich, but they had this enormous house, and it was only three bedrooms, but they had all this extra space, like both a living room and a den and a game room, too. And Violet and I would always sit on the carpet, on the carpet in the living room. They had this bright red carpet, and it was so fluffy. It felt like a shaggy pillow. Not to rush you along, Daryl pressed. But this all sounds normal. This all sounds like what I thought Amanda would say. Nothing about, well, let's just get to the point. What happened to Violet? One day I was sitting on the carpet in her living room. 
It had been like any other school day. Go to school, learn nothing, wait to spend the afternoon with my best friend in her amazingly decorated house. I was on Violet's iPad and I was looking at this dress. It was fuchsia. You don't see that color too much, and it looked like one that would blow in the breeze when you'd wear it. Violet came into the living room with a glass of something in her hand, and there was something wrong with her. Her eyes were just darker and wide, and she looked like she looked like a different person. It was like a different person had taken over Violet's body. And she said, What are you doing, you fat cow, looking at new dresses? You're already disgusting. A dress will never save you. Very weird sentences. It didn't sound like her. I mean, I never wore dresses to begin with. I just wore t-shirts and pants. Kind of like I'm wearing now. But that's when it began. That's when the evil began. Evil? Daryl asked. Yes, Mandy insisted. I believe so, Daryl. I mean, that was not Violet. That was something else. The evil continued. She kept asking. She she just got worse, worse and worse. Each day she was a little meaner, like nastier than one day. Mandy tried not to cry. She wanted to break composure. She could even see her words were not having a major impact on Daryl. He was curious and listening with strong attention, but she knew he wasn't comprehending the feelings that she wanted to share. What did you do? Daryl asked Mandy. I'm trying to tell you what happened, Mandy snapped. I mean, what did you say to her when she started being nasty to you? Daryl clarified. Mandy bit her lip, as she did not expect that question, and she didn't know what to say. I froze, she confessed. I froze. I, I didn't know what to do. The first day she just insulted me, and every time I just, I wanted to say something, but I, the words just didn't come out. I'm sorry, Mandy, Daryl consoled her. No, no, I'm the one who did it. Mandy went on. After school every day, I still went to her home. I just wanted her to stop. I wanted her to snap out of it. I hated what she was doing, but she was still my friend. I thought in one second she would just go back to being Violet again, and we would be best friends like we used to be. Mandy paused again. The first day she just yelled at me and called me names. The next day she slapped me and started hitting me more and more. I yelled at her to stop, but it was like there wasn't a human there. No matter what I said, she just kept hitting me. She started laughing, but then she just went blank. It was like there wasn't a real person there. No expression. No one was listening to my screams. Her parents are both dentists, I should say. So they, they work a lot of long hours. They're never in the house during that time. But whatever. I mean, they weren't there. It was just, what's wrong with me? Why didn't I do something? Why didn't I just walk away? Why didn't I just stop going to her house? Why? I'm a freak. The tears were well into Mandy's eyes, but she was holding them back. You're not a freak, said Daryl. Look, I still don't know what you did to Violet, but I can guess Violet w was going through something. I told you, Mandy chirped. It was the evil. Maybe, Daryl tried to be polite. But it sounds like she was troubled. I mean, you said this happened like out of nowhere. One day she is just polite and friendly. Well, your best friend. And the next day she's acting all mean. Then started hitting you. I'm not a scientist or a psychologist or anything like that. But it sounds like either there's something you're not telling me. Or violence was experiencing a type of psychological problem. I mean, it happens all the time. Especially to people in their teen years. There can be this type of pressure that you were... Um, even her best friend, and don't know about. Or it could just be brain chemistry. Some people have these things called psychotic breaks or psychotic episodes. It's when, I know what those are, Mandy fired back at him. The truth was, she wasn't sure what either of those terms meant, but she didn't like the way that Daryl wasn't believing her. You don't know what happened next, Mandy went on. She started acting like that on a Monday. Her mean streak came out only with me. No one else at school or anywhere else noticed what was going on. On Friday, I went to her house again. I feel so stupid for going. I knew she was. I knew the evil was inside of her. Violet lived on the edge of Reno. It was. It starts to get pretty far out there. Mandy took a small breath. I was back in Violet's house, and I was sitting down. 
this time in her game room, and although I, I wasn't doing anything, I was just sitting there, staring at the wall, hoping that Violet wouldn't explode like she had done before. Then she came into the room running, and Violet was back. I mean, she was her normal self, and she said, Mandy, Mandy, come quick.